This is NTV Weekend Edition. You're just in time for the day's top stories ahead. Tonight, five suspects of the Riverside Drive terror attack commence a custodial sentence. The court also takes note that this offense that is being investigated is serious. Police say this is just the beginning as more suspects are arrested. Also live at 9 p.m., Abdullah Ogelo recounts how he came face to face with a suicide bomber seconds before detonation. Plus, we met the communication guy who was supposed to link us to the CEO, then we met the CEO on third floor. I found myself standing alone, so I also went down, crawled for safety. An ordinary assignment turned into a hostage situation. Also tonight, walking a new political road in Ukambani. Oh, what what are our that? When I was a poor president. Eti wanataka kuwa rise wa Kenya. How what nani amewaroga jamani? Birth pangs of an unlikely political alliance and Dr. Ruto's prescription for political ailments. You can actually say the Lord's Prayer as many times. Especially Mambo Kikiumana. Unasema Marasaba. Get ready for even better medicine, laughter on Bullseye. It's nine o'clock. Thanks for joining us tonight. Our sign language interpreter is David Agondoa. A top story. Five suspects connected to the Riverside Drive terror attack will spend the next 30 days in custody. The suspects, among them one woman, were today arraigned at the Milimani Law Courts, where detectives sought more time to hold the suspects longer in order to complete their probe. The director of public prosecution, Nurdin Haji, has appointed a team of prosecutors to offer technical help to the detectives investigating the attack that saw 21 people killed. NTV's investigative editor Dennis Okari looks at the profiles of some of the suspects and why the police want more time to hold them. More photos have emerged of one of the terrorists known as Ali Salim Gishunge, also known as Farouk Juma or Salim Idris. NTV has obtained still images captured from surveillance footage of Farouk entering the three-bedroom bungalow in Guango Estate in Mushada, Kiambu County. The timestamp records him on Jamhuri Day in 2018, two minutes to 11 p.m. with a woman neighbors presume was his wife. Violet Omoyo Kemunto, who is standing next to Farouk, is believed to have crossed over to Somalia after the attack. But this was not before the couple put up a sale of all the household goods and electronics on Facebook. The post showing the time on Monday at 7.45 a.m., just seven hours before the attack, says they were moving out of Nairobi in the week, so it was a quick sale of 100,000 shillings for everything in their house. They had given the landlord a notice of January 6, 2019, to move at the end of the month. Farouk, known to neighbors as a quiet man who loved his cats and loud music, used his car with the other gunmen to storm 14 Riverside Drive, it is here investigators found bomb-making materials at the house in Mushada. Police investigating the terror attack are still building up their case that includes interrogation of suspects in custody and interviews with family members who are assisting them with information. Meanwhile, five suspects were today arraigned in court where the state applied to have them detained for 30 days to enable detectives conclude their probe. The DCI has started investigations on Joel Nganga Wainaina, Oliver Kanyago Mude, Gladys Kari Justice, Guleid Abdi Hakim, and Osman Ibrahim. Two of the suspects in court were arrested on Wednesday in Isli and Raqqa estates. Phone communication has established the two were talking to the terrorists during the 20 hour siege. The court said the charges they were facing were serious and investigators may be required to travel to various parts of the country. Another key suspect is being pursued in Eldred. Dennis Okari, NTV. 
As investigations continue, more counts come in of those who survived the attack and uh, definitely those who have uh, good tales of saying thank you uh, to God for being safe. And uh, they can give us a bit more details of what it was like to be in that situation as it happened. And I have in studio Abdullahi Ogelo. Now, he came face to face with a suicide bomber just moments before he detonated his uh, vest or the explosive that he had, whatever it was. And uh, he's here to share his ordeal. He's more comfortable with Swahili. So, wacha ni pambane na hali. Shukran kwa kuungana nasi. Sa wacha ni kuulize mwanzo. Najua saizu wa sema alhamdulillah, yani, kwa bilo uko hai. Ebu tueleze, shuguli yako kule ilikuwa nini? Shuguli yako kule unafanya kazi ya supervision. Mambo ujenzu jenzi kidogo. Sa kama yu siku tukua na shuguli ya kupaka rangi ya parkings. Ok. Ndi ilikuwa shuguli ya siku ya hiyo. Sa tukiona hapa kwa hii video inonyesha ni saa tisa hapo. Na ulikuwa napita ukielekea upande huu. Hapa hata uini mtu unamjua. Uini unamjua ni supervisor wa cleaners hapo. Na uyu hapa uyu ndo uyu mgaidi. Kasi uyu ndo uyu mgaidi. Wakati uyu sikujua ni mgaidi. Hadi wakati kulilipuka. Sikujua ni mgaidi. Ngejua ni mgaidi. Sidani kawa ningefita injia. Asa uyu ya hapo. Asa uyu ndo uyu mimi hapa. Hata uyu nyozangu nyoliona hii picha. Hapo hapo kanza simu. Akini wa muangalia ni kawa nishuka. Hapo ni kashtuka. Ni damu ni kashtuka. Kuna hile sixth sense ina kuambia. Kuna kitu ni kama baya. Hasa ni wana ni kama angalia. Mwana maneno ni kasikia kidogo wa kizungumza kwa simu. Halo, halo. Sorry. Halisema. Kwani mkua wapi bwana? Kwani mkua wapi? Kwa kusua elekisadifu kabisa. Kwani mkua wapi? Si mimi niko. Uku ya melekea kia angalia yo secret garden. Si mimi niko. Niko. Jobade ni kwa ni mepi? Mepita. Wakati nifika mahali kama hapa. Mungu wengi alifikiria. Hapa hapa inanukana ni kwa unatoroka. Mungu alifikiri ni metoroka. Pana hapa mahali pa meinuka kidogo. Kwa 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 Na hapo wali niambia ni kwa tome jishika shika 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 kifuwa kizungumuzo. Wakati ni mpita sani kimuangalia kwa ya shika shika kifuwa. Suti nye usi. So unajia mtakiwa na suti wezi jua. Na tareja siyapo ni mali business premise. Kila mtatakuwa kwa simu yake. So ndi mi nikavuka, nikaingia. Nia yangu ilikuwa kwenda kwa salime majama zangu wapo. In secret garden? That secret garden. Nkahao. So ulikuwa nikawa umetulia kazi, umetulia kidogo. Kazi umetulia after noon. Yoni kasi ya kumbuka. Nye kwa salime kuna jama account wantama hitu wa job alikuwa na manager ya hiyo restaurant anaitwa Mary. Uh -huh. Nikawapata hapo nikampata pia alikuwa na chef hapa anaitwa Vini. Walikuwa wanazungumza. Nikaingia hata kiniona tunaiona ndio mimi. Uh -huh. Nikaingia pole pole hadi nikaingia ndani. Kuingia ndani kwa wasalimia hata ikumaliza dakika moja. Kwa less than a minute. Kusikia mlipuko puf. Kasikia ni kama uso nikaa Fortunately vinyi nilikuwa ndani ya screen kidogo na fikiri nilizuia hiyo nini iko nipiga kidogo kuangalia hapo kando hivi. Naona jamaa waiter yuko kwa sakafu kuna glass imetapaka hapo nje. Kitilikuja kwa kili kwanza juu niko kwa restaurant ni maybe ni gas explosion or what. Ah kabla sijajibu kwa ndani ya moyo milia risasi kaanza. No. Kuangalia kule nje kulikuwa na mteja alikuwa yakula hapo hivyo. Nikamwona nikaa kichwa kiko juu ya meza. Sasa naye milia risasi imeanza kuzidi nikaja hapa nikubandi nikamwambia jana nikubaya tu to. Akili kakumbuka tu emergency exit. Ndiyo sawa wapaelewa vizuri huko. Eh huko kuna kuna drill, kuna drill huko, kuna drill every time. So clients wao wanaelezwa in case of emergency. Hata hiyo injili tengenezwa purposely for that in a service emergency exit. Uh -huh. Na pia business purpose sababu kuna wateja pia wanaishi kuna mbwa ya pili. Baada ya mlipuko naona watu wakikimbia wakielekea upande huu. Nah, nah. Si inaonekana wagaidi walikuwa nakuja waki waki shoot hao walikimbia. Uh -huh. Walikuwa nasikia milia risasi kutoka pande main gate. Uh -huh. Ndio sawa uliona watu wanakimbia hata mtu wa kwanza yeye alikuwa guard wala walikuwa wakimbia eh, kuna gada ilikuwa hapo mmoja kuna hapo majamaa walitoka bana nyingo nyeusi nyeusi walikuwa waiters kwa hiyo restaurant hiyo ndio hata ya yao na kulikuwa hata na mashefu alikuwa na nyepe nyepe alikuwa na chef hapo hata mimi utaniona nikipita kwa mbio na nilipofika hapa hivi kuona hii mili imetapaka tapaka ndio yeah. nikashtuka ai yani mimi ndio nimepita hapo ile jamii jamaa alikuwa hapa ndio amejilipua ama nini uli connect yeah nika connect hata na huko unakimbi <laughs> aya yani nilipita karibu na gaidi bila kujua ah. Saizo ni meruka kidogo na ufia tinsi kanyage vifani vinyame lakini vikuwa mbetapaka kila maili kabidi tu kanyage. Haa wapu wakimbia. Haa ndiyo wakimbia waitas. Mimi ndiyo uyo. Ndiyo uyo wata kufia ndiyo uyo. Waa. Nisa kusonga kule chini kidogo wapu karibu na katara yao sinaonda na kifande kingine cha nyama. Cha mwili ya nikiko wapu. Na watu kwa likuwa naondoka ndani ya buildings. Huku ngina mshutuke mlipuko wapu wakansa kulize kwa nini mbaya. Kambia majama umesikia mlipuko. Ni kujioko enda emergency. Wacha maswali mengi. Maswali taulizia kule mbe. Tuendeni. Tuende pande huu. 
wengine walikuwa wanatoka kwa fire exit pande huu kila mmoja akitoka pande hiyo tukakimbia hadi ngamba pili riverside park na no. safika so, ngamba pili ile kiriosi tushaona tikao kwa safe tukasimama kuangalia nyuma milia risasi na inazidi ku kuja kidogo panic mode ndio kaingia kidogo tena ndio Faisal ko shanza kusikia sirens labda polisi wana wana respond kwa sababu wanasema wali respond haraka sana. Ya yeah, hiyo kwa sababu kwa Marisa ndio kuna sikia zaidi. Zaidi zaidi siku sikia sirens za hiyo sababu ni attention ilikuwa hiyo risasi ta 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 na kelele hapo na tatu kutoka tu. Yeah. So kufika kwa pili hapo karibu Galileo na veterinary hapo kaka kaka karibu dakika moja nne hivi tano. Kuna jamaa alikuwa anatoka Westlands hapo hivyo. Nasema eh na tumeona response came toko kwa mbio mbio kie. Kasema hey, basi it was swift and fast which in receive to engage and to swift and fast and I thank god for that na uko ona mgaidi mwingine yoyote kati ya wale wengine watano tuliambiwa hata mimi kama huyu ndio nijoni mgaidi wakati nigundua ni gaidi baada kulifuka mwingine si kuona ambapo ningejua ni gaidi sijui kama ningepita hapo kweli yeah ni kweli hakuna mtu aliyeza pita hapo kujua kuna gaidi sababu hata angekuwa na amebrandish kitu kama gani hivi singepita ningeshuku na hata ungereza alarm hata ningereza alarm nikimbia lakini si kujua hata nashukuru mungu hakuniita niti labda anataka kunizungumzia so ni Mungu anajua kwa nini hakuniita ama siku na chochote hapo ulipita yeah, tu ya cause hiyo ilikuwa short sana na hapo baada ya mlipuko unaona umesema wale tunaona wako wamevaa suti za black hivi mm. kuna wengine walikuwa walinzi kuna si black kuna mtu mmoja nao alikuwa na blue blue hiyo ni guard mm -hmm. alafu kuna wajama alikuwa nyeusi sababu hata yao jamaa secret garden wa black au white as one of our black so, Yeah. yeah na huyu hapo huyu ni hapo uliniambia ni huyu ni supervisor cleaners mwanamke ya yeah, naitwa Ali Nusurika pia yeah hata ukiona malikutana ni kitambo ilikutana kuna mtu yuko hapa ilikutana ya kitambo alikuwa shapita okay. mwangalia si ndio huyo mimi kabla hata ni muda kidogo yeah. alikuwa shapita na kuuliza jeu walinzi kwa sababu saizi mm. kuna mm. hilo jambo la uh, walinzi wa kibinafsi wanaohudumia um, mali ya umma wapewe leseni wawe na bunduki wewe uwezaona kama kwa hii situation ingesaidia zaidi ama wasemaje mwenyewe maoni yangu naona it's a good idea bora wa trainiwe kuwa na guidelines nzuri za kuwaya kusaidia kwa hiyo kazi hapo unajua inge dita pia labda hiyo number 21 tuli lose either labda tunge lose labda tu tatu or less kwa hiyo inge dita inge waengeje au materials wa gundu eh hapo mali tumeenda mm. baba it's a good idea bora kuwe na good guidelines okay yeah uh, support it umepata counseling labda hivi umeweza kulala baada ile tukio unajua si sikio kwa movie yani kama movie na hora kwangu sikio kwanza imekuwa shida kidogo ah. kijaribu sutumbo imejea gas ni choo tu saa yote choo saa yote ukienda choo appetite hata mwanamke anashtuka na mimi kidogo ndio pole pole kuna jamaa amenitumia link hapa ananiambia niende mali kana nitalemea sana niende counseling kiasi ah. ya lakini najaribu familia wako aje sasa walijua mara ya kwanza ulikuwa hapa saa ngapi walianza kupigia saa ngapi familia wakati uliona news Ah, okay. My sister ndiye alikuwa na mom akapiga sina akagundua alisikia kaona do sit kumeatakiwa akakumbuka my brother wa, works there ndiye akanipigia simu anaitwa Violet kanipigia simu ikiwa na mom mom najua anafikiri alikuwa amenisikia aliambiwa na haya akaisha kidogo mm. the sister ndiye aliongea na mimi nikamwambia my dear tumevamiwa kidogo lakini ana nimeponyoka no. kidogo kufika hapo na simu zilikuwa nyingi nyingi nataka kushika nimpigie mke mke na alikuwa shughuli zake kiasi hapo huko barabara kwa karibu na television ndio nikashika simu nikampigia pia mke wangu jifaza ulikuwa unashughulika kuangalia colleagues wako wapi lazima mjue kila mtu kampigia mke halo my dear unajua nini kinaendelea umeona ti hapana sijui unajua uko tumevamiwa ati ya tumevamiwa na magaidi kwa akashtuka lakini sasa hizo ulikuwa ushatoka niko hapo veterinary hapo wa highway hapo veterinary kwa nje anambia eh nikwambia niko sawa basi kuja kwa nyumba kama sisi kuja sasa hivi acha nishughulike nijue kama colleagues zangu wote pia wako sawa mm. jilikuwa anachukua na role call na sawa ama ulipoteza mtu ah, kuna wale uh, sister company hiyo maliwa tunaenda canteen lunch kuna wale my close friends kuna mm. mtana secretary wa GM ambaye alikuwa afikia yeah pole sana nasema pole na iwapo waweza tafadhali tafuta <coughs> huduma za counseling najua mm. iko iko tayari kuna watu wengi wako tayari kusaidia shukran sana kwa kutu, kwa kutupa muda wako tunasema pia asante kwa familia wakiendelea kukusaidia kwa uh, this very trying time as you would understand and uh, uh, abdullahi is not the only person who survived as you can and understand this is a very trying time uh, we also had some close uh, colleagues who uh, had a close shave in this very same encounter smriti That's right, Mark, and um, thank you to Ogelo for sharing his experience with us. Such a close shave, and no doubt it is not easy to share something like that and to relive it as well.
All right, well, as you mentioned, Mark, yes, it isn't every day that uh, journalists turn out to be the newsmakers. But this Tuesday, during the Dusit D2 attack, two of NTV's journalists found themselves in that very position. Reporter Silas Apollo and cameraman Dixon Onyango were caught up in the attack as they prepared to conduct an interview at one of the offices in the complex. Well, they narrated their 12-hour ordeal to NTV's Brenda Wanga. Hey. Hi. The Tuesday afternoon assignment took NTV's reporter Silas Apollo and cameraman Dixon Onyango to 14 Riverside Drive for an interview at the Commission on Revenue Allocation Officers at the Gross Venner building. We got at 14 Riverside Ducid at I think some minutes past 2.40, it was around 2.48 or something. Of course, then we went to the CRA guys, uh, the officers, which was on second floor. We met the communication guy who was supposed to link us to the CEO. Then we met the CEO on third floor. But before the interview got underway, the first blast shook the buildings. This moment clearly discernible in this clip. You could hear it. From a distance, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a blast that lasted, I think, a few minutes, you know, and, and, and then after that, there were gunshots. At that moment, in my mind, I hadn't really figured out that this is an attack happening on us. You know, we thought probably something else happening in another building, or some building was coming down. Silas was like, and there's, a guy, there's a guy who said that this, that must have been a tire bust. And I told the guys, I've never heard of such. Before we could even ponder our reason what it was, uh, gunshots were all over. That was the beginning of what would be a 12-hour siege for the two journalists alongside hundreds of others caught up in the terrorist attack. Guys were not really rushing down the stairs. It was, it was a bit organized, the way people were walking down the stairs. And then Dixon, in his curiosity of wanting to be a cameraman and get the shots, asked me to carry the tripod and the bag, the camera bag, which also had the other equipment. So he decided he wanted to like take a shot of what was happening. But before he even could frame and take a shot, I think that's when we realized that this thing is not as interesting as we thought. There was, a, a, I think someone shot at us, you know, yes. the, the, the people that were in that stairs. I don't know if it was through the window or they had walked into, into the, the, the staircase, because that, that gunshot was so loud and so near that everyone scampered for safety, you know, everyone went down flat. After the first bullet, the bullet that came through us, uh, I think that's the point Silas and team went down. I found myself standing alone, so I also went down, crawled for safety. I couldn't tell where my brother was, so me, we are in a team of eight, I believe. We went into a room which had two doors. In the ensuing melee, Dixon and Silas were separated, each one seeking the safest place to hide from the armed assailants. We were in a team of eight, I believe. We went into a room which had two doors. We opened the first door and then went to the next one. But the guy who came last closed the first one and then we went and closed the second one. You see, inside there, at least we were beat relaxed but you know everything your heart is beating i think there were two worships we went and hid in the first one and then we somehow realized this is not the safest place so we were like trying to look for another one so when we the moment we got out to probably look for a more secure place i think it, that's the second that's the second time i think we also shot at you know from from the outside from outside so they shot at us and then we ran back and 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 for this area that, that in as much as this is not the safest place to be, I think this is the only uh, place option we have. So we went and hid in. I think we were like five people in the first one, and then the adjacent one had like seven people. Those caught up in the attack barricaded themselves in the offices, flat on the floor. Not a single sound emanated from those trapped here. The silence only shattered, but the gunshots fired around them. Those in this predicament were silently mouthing their last prayers. Some guys were trying to break into doors and so forth. So it's a point of making your prayers, repenting your sins. You know, it's made of so many things. 
and uh, we could not even believe we'll make it outside. And for me, that was the most scariest thing. You're in a place you know you're going to die, but you just don't know when. So you keep hope alive that something would happen. Hopeful of a rescue, but also preparing for the worst outcome. I think we got to a point where we like, I think we, we have to fight. If push comes to shove, you know, we'll have to fight and fight our way out and probably. Outside the building, efforts to get the hostages out safe and sound were picking up, culminating in the switching off of all the lights in the buildings, sometimes around midnight. The lights went off, I think some minutes, towards midnight or past midnight, you know, and, and that's when we were like, I think this is now an indication that nobody is busy, nobody is actually coming. Just one minute shy of 4 a.m. Wednesday morning, the crew, alongside others on the second floor of the Grosvenor building, were finally rescued. Barefoot, glad to be alive and unscathed, the hostages filed out of the building and into the arms of their kin and colleagues. At that time, when I saw our officers outside, of course, you know, it was really good. It was a good feeling for me personally. And that's the moment I shouted to my colleagues, you know, guys, we are... The officers are out here, out here for us, and uh, it was a positive feeling. We thank God that we came out alive, and, and probably for a reason. There's a reason why we are still alive, you know. Brenda Wanga, NTV. And as their teammates were certainly glad that they are safe, and uh, yes, they're getting some time to rest and counseling as well. Very necessary. And on to the ongoing investigations, the Kenya Defense Force has revealed that the suicide bomber who detonated himself at the Duse complex is 25-year-old Al-Shabaab operative Mahir Khalid Rizik. Mahir, who was born and brought up in Mombasa, sneaked back into the country on January 13th from Somalia, where he had been undergoing training since 2018. Upon returning, he connected with uh, Ali Salim Geshunge, alias Farouk, in Mushaba in Kiambu County. And the KDF has also established that he was recruited while attending prayers at Musa Mosque in Mombasa by recruiter Ramadan Hamisi Kufungwa, who is now in Somalia fighting alongside Al-Shabaab. In 2014, Mahir was part of an assassination cell tasked by the Al-Shabaab to kill security personnel in the coast region. He fled to Somalia after the attack. Well, Mahir would regularly contact his wife, Suhaila Mualim Bakari. All right, on that note, let's take a breather. It is 20 past nine, much more when we return.
Welcome back to NTV Weekend Edition. Just to recap on that story on the details emerging, we have some pictures of those who are said to be to have been behind the attack. The Kenya Defense Force has revealed that the suicide bomber who detonated himself at the Dusik complex is 25-year-old Al-Shabaab operative Mahir Khalid Rizik. All right, we can bring you those pictures. Mahir, who was born and brought up in Mombasa, sneaked back into the country on January 13th from Somalia, where he had been undergoing training since 2018. Upon Turning, he connected with Ali Salim Gishunge, alias Farouk, in Mushada in Kiambu County. The KDF has also established that he was recruited while attending prayers at Musa Mosque in Mombasa by recruiter who's on your screen, Ramadan Hamisi Kufungwa, who is now in Somalia fighting alongside Al Shabaab. In 2014, Mahir was part of an assassination cell tasked by the Al-Shabaab to kill security personnel in the coast region. And the lady there on your screen is believed to be his wife. He fled to Somalia after the attack and Mahir would regularly contact his wife, Sohela Mualim Bakari. Looking forward in terms of preparing ourselves for imminent attacks and private security guards manning public places will in the next six months be licensed to carry firearms. The government, through the Private Security Regulatory Authority, made the announcement explaining that the guards will have to undergo intensive training by the government. Within the same timeline, all employees in private security firms will undergo a mandatory security vetting to be carried out by the NIS and the DCI. Well, Private Security Regulatory Authority CEO Fazul Mohammed, however, confirmed that the firearms would only be given on risk assessment. NTV's Mel Miendo reports. The response by Kenyan security forces in the Tuesday afternoon attack at 14 Riverside Drive has been commended both nationally and internationally. 21 people lost their lives, but... No, we're retreating now. 700 others were rescued in an operation that was sensitively and intricately carried out. The presence of firearms was evident. Not only were the security forces armed, but licensed civilians too, who all fought united in relinquishing the enemy. At a disadvantage, however, was Senaka security team, manning the entrance of the Dusit D2 hotel, unarmed, yet they were the very first to face the terrorists. Two security guards were among those killed. Private security firms must be allowed and must be licensed to allow their private security officers to carry firearms. And now, in an attempt to counter such attacks, the Private Security Regulatory Authority has confirmed that private security guards will undergo mandatory vetting. The people who we are going to issue firearms to, uh, they will be for specific uh, purpose and for specific uh, assignment. That includes uh, those officers who guard, who uh, provide security, for, for key installations, especially where there's a lot of human traffic. We are going to create a, an armory where to store the, the guns at the, with the company. The, the employee is the one who will be entrusted because he knows the assignment which requires what? A tool of trade. You cannot just arm every card. Security guards in private security firms will now have a mandatory insurance cover, overtime paid to those who will work for more than eight hours, and a uniform salary structure for both day and night guards. All private security companies pay minimum wage, which is around 15,000. They pay extra hours, which is around 8,700. Then they also pay uh, house allowance, which is around 2,000, and uh, responsibility allowance. That brings the entire minimum wage uh, level to almost 25,000. The government is taking its security system very seriously. The training that security officers will now be given is internationally acquired and will allow them to work in any other country. Mel Miendo, NTV, Nairobi. All right, well, that story forms the basis of our question tonight. We're eager to know, do you support the arming of private security guards manning public places? Do you support the arming of private security guards manning public places? Tweet us at NTV Kenya, at Smriti Vidyathi, at Mark Masai, and we will be able to share some of your views. That's at NTV Kenya 
at Sreti Vidyarthi and at Mark Masai. And you could SMS 20686. All right, now elsewhere, the search for the next Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission Chief Executive Officer has begun. The IBC has advertised a position on its website seeking suitable candidates to fill the position that fell vacant last October after Ezra Chiloba was found pal palpable by the Commission of Electoral Procurement impropriety in the 2017 general election. But as Ken Majugu reports, this position that seems jinxed is not the only vacancy at the IEBC. Some stakeholders want the entire commission disbanded. In the advertisement, the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission is seeking a degree holder from a recognized university with 15 years of proven relevant experience in either electoral management, public administration law, and political science, five years of which must be at a comparable senior management level, preferably in public sector. The candidate must also be a member of a professional body, have a proven experience in leadership management and corporate governance, and meet the requirements of Chapter 6 of the Constitution. The incoming Chief Executive Officer will report to the Commission, and his responsibilities include executing decisions of the Commission, assignment of duties and supervision of employees, facilitating Commission's mandate and ensuring staff compliance with the public ethics and values. Ezra Chilobo was suspended twice and eventually fired last October. He was accused of impropriety and failing to appear before the Commission to answer to those accusations. How can we have an institution ambayo haiheshimu Supreme Court? Allow an institution ambayo haiheshimu wa Kenya? Institution ambayo haiheshimu Rais wa Jamhuri ya Kenya? Kubu wali mdamenga president? Those commissioners lied to the president. But this was just part of the intrigues that have dogged the electoral body. Before then, several commissioners resigned, citing bad leadership under Fula Chibukati. The commission now is suffering from a serious credibility crisis, both at the secretariat and both at the, at the commission level. This is why many stakeholders in the political scene want the entire commission relieved of their duties. So when I see uh, William Ruto issuing threats here, I've just seen Akisema Kwamba, they will not allow at the staffers or IBC to be dealt with. And yet, the finding of the Supreme Court is a committed illegalities, irregularities. The application deadline is on the 31st of this month. The chief executive officer, who is also the head of the secretariat and the accounting officer of the electoral body, shall hold the office for a term of five years, but shall be eligible for renewal for another term of five years. Even as the recruitment drive begins at the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission, the challenge remains the high staff turnover, especially the commissioners and the senior secretariat staff. Those in the know say it will be a mountain getting a suitable replacement for Ezra Chiloba, especially with what's going on at the commission. Ken Mijungu, NTV. Well, with the search of new uh, candidates from that office, let's look at a new uh, employee in another office. Major retired Twalib Mubarak has completed his first week in office with uh, many Kenyans placing their hopes in the former military and civil intelligence officer to turn things around at Integrity Center. While securing convictions will be top on his agenda, Mubarak, in his plans for the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, had set out a four-point agenda which would involve radical changes which may or may not be popular but key nonetheless. Tuesday, January the 15th was the first full day in office for Major Retired Twalib Mubarak, who after being sworn into office, takes over as the Secretary to the Commission and the CEO of the EACC. Beginning a six-year journey that many Kenyans hope will be different from that of his predecessor, Hala Kewako. One of the biggest problems of this organization is the perception by the public that it's not working. So I want to come in with a new zeal and take forward this organization. Top on his four-point agenda is a complete employee audit, which he himself notes is key in ensuring transparency within the EACC before they look at those from outside. I want to look at the human placement. Do we have the right people at the right place? For the former chief of security at Kenjen, 
This will be key to enable him to turn around the much criticized EACC amid claims that some employees had gone to bed with kingpins of corruptions, hindering the commission's war on graft. Other than seeking prosecutorial powers for the commission, there had been suggestions of policy change, seeking to vet those within the commission, but this is yet to happen. Most of us believe that vetting is the day when you are employed, somebody look at your background and you get into the organization. It should be a mechanism within the staff to monitor are they involved in possible malpractice contrary to what they promised the public. With about a thousand files having been forwarded to the DPP in the last six years, less than 10 high-ranking cases have been heard to conclusions with convictions given. The judiciary and the investigating and prosecuting agencies have engaged in a back and forth over who is to blame over the shortcomings. The agencies involved in the investigation, and that's where you come in, Mr. Tolib. You have to carry out thorough investigations and bring cases to court when you yourself are confident of uh, getting a conviction. The judiciary too, while it is independent, and you know I personally, respect the rule of law and the Constitution and the independence of this institution. But independence can be no substitute for either impunity and independence cannot be a substitute for not doing what is right. As part of his four-point agenda, the retired major seeks to revisit all pending cases. Those that have either taken ages in court are at the DPP's desk or files of investigations that are yet to move past the initial stages of investigations. In his proposal to Parliament, the new CEO seeks to have legislation amended to give the Commission ability to go after the big fish alone, leaving the smaller ones to other investigating agencies. It is in your opinion that you need to focus. He also seeks to get the backing of the August House to get the necessary laws in place to ensure that asset recovery is a straightforward affair. Without fear, favor, bias, affection. But even with the best laid out plans. So help me God. He will need to make a huge climb and rub some shoulders the wrong way to reach his goals. <laughs> Leila Mohamed, NTV. Tolib, baraka to you as you take on this task. Not an easy one, but all the best. Now to our opinion counts question. Do you support the arming of private security guards manning public places? We have some good answers coming in. We certainly do. Some responses on Twitter. Michael Maganga, you say no. Let's not rush to arming these private guards out of emotions of this attack. Let's calm down and reason on how we would encounter terrorism. We shouldn't make decisions when we're mad. Alan Wajohi, you say in most countries worldwide, private security companies hire those who've served in a particular institution of national security. Maybe having more arms police might be a better option than arming those without field experience with firearms. Cosmos, you say no, they should not arm the guards. They should instead deploy officers to man the installations. Arming the guards will lead to an increase in the misuse of firearms and possible instances of gun hiring due to poor pay. Last one, Kev the Brand, you say yes, I support, not because I am comfortable with it, but because it is a necessary risk. I hope the government will be extremely cautious, you put that in capital, with regulating the security and accountability of this armament move. All right, and just one more uh, that supports it. Um, I support the idea as long as they're willing to face the attackers and are exceptionally trained for the job. That is from you, Honor. I support the idea of taking a break. Business is up <laughs> next. Stay with us.
the business news up next for you and commercial banks could soon have room to impose interest rates above the legally set ceiling while lending to small and medium businesses if a proposal by a member of parliament sails through parliament. Gatundu South MP Moses Kuria says that his proposal seeks to unlock credit access to the private sector. His interviews Julian Zamboko. In 2016, Growth in credit taken up by the private sector averaged 9.3%, momentum which slowed down to a paltry 2.4% by 2017, with analysts blaming the adoption of rate caps which came into force in September of 2016. Despite the slight pickup in 2018, concerns abound that the private sector's access to credit is still stifled by the law, especially for small and medium enterprises. Gatundu South Member of Parliament now proposes to amend the law to introduce a risk negotiation window of up to six percentage points above the prescribed ceiling, a movie sales should address the existing challenge. Is it better to have slightly more expensive credit that's available or to have cheaper credit on paper that is not available? And that's a whole argument. Because now it is cheaper. We protect it. But for what? To who? Because nobody is getting the credit. Who are we protecting? Assuming the current proposal was in force today with the central bank benchmark rate at 9%, commercial banks would be able to charge up to 19% in interest rates against SMEs compared to the present ceiling of 13%. But with the draft budget policy statement indicating that domestic borrowing is likely to go up, I sought to understand how the fiscal environment would impact this proposal. I informed Henry Rostich on, on, about what, what I'm doing and he, he took the opportunity also to tell me what he's doing. He's setting up a very huge uh, national credit guarantee facility so which is going to you know uh, sort of take off some of the burden of the risk from the banks. In August 2019, Kenya will mark three years since the law imposing caps on lending rates was adopted. It remains to be seen whether this year efforts to amend this law will yield any fruit. Julian's Amboko, NTV. All right, further afield, opposition leader Raila Odinga has announced today that the standard gauge railway will reach Kisumu County before the end of this year. Raila also told a gathering in Kisumu that a modern and bigger port is set to be constructed in the Lakeside County to tap into the massive economic potential in lake transport and reclaim Kisumu's lost glory as the East African region's hub of business. NTV's Oko Okusa reports. <laughs> Raila, who is also the African Union's special envoy for transport and infrastructure, was speaking in Kisumu this afternoon while launching a dredging vessel meant to rehabilitate the port of Kisumu. He said that the government was committed to revamping the economy of the lakeside region by improving transport infrastructure both on land and on water. They're going to construct an 80 meter wide canal, 80 meter wide, 63 kilometers long, up on the river. So that when the day will be a bigger ship, to come as well here. Yeah. But now, the three ships can come here. Yeah. Raila noted that with a vibrant and efficient lake transport, the cost of ferrying oil and dry cargo will drastically reduce. But then as you can see, the Guinea pipeline has put up a gate on the other side, meaning that now the oil will be collected from Kisumu and can by ship. And that is cheaper and more cost effective to transport oil by ship than by road. The ceremony was also attended by a delegation from Uganda. We are building four ships on the side of Uganda in Kaoku to carry fuel from the port here of Kisumu all the way to Uganda in the port and one ship will be able to carry the equivalent of what Uganda consumes in one day. During the event, Raila also assured residents that the removal of the obnoxious water hyacinth weed will commence immediately to pave the way for the dredging exercise. 
Okokusa NTV. And now let's get a check of the markets. The Nairobi Securities Exchange shrugged off this week's terror attack to wrap up Friday's trade with the market capitalization at 39 billion shillings higher than it closed last week, signaling a gain for investors. The bulls closed the week two percentage points higher than last week. And this week's trading was dominated by Safaricom, which accounted for 62% of the value traded. Key developments this week entailed the commencement of the purchase offer of the Kenol Cobles share by French firm Ruby Energy and uh, at 23 shillings per share and the extension of the suspension of the shares of retailer Deacons East Africa from trading for another 10 days. And that's your business news. There's more when we return. Mutu are sleeping on the same political bed. Are you aware? Strange, right? <laughs> Strange indeed, but that is the nature of politics. Sometimes it brings together very strange bedfellows indeed. It's all about handshakes and the spirit has now been devolved. And as Emmanuel Juma now reports on Bullseye, a new political alliance, Kingimu, is in its formative stages in Okambani. They are walking a new political road in Ukambani. It is the Kibwana Ngilu Mutua Alliance or Kingimu in short. And that sounds like Ikamba, doesn't it? Anyway, the scheming is on and is being done standing, walking, and sometimes while seated. Operation Kalonzo must retire is on. But ladies and gentlemen, who will be president? Oh, what what are our tattoo? wanaweza kuwa president eti wanataka kuwa rais wa Kenya hao watu nani amewaroga jamani nani aliambia kibudha kuwa rais ni kusimama makuweni haiyeye <coughs> na ikiwa kuna wengine pia ukambani na Kenya nzima wanataka kuwa president waitishe if he thinks he's too popular we challenge him now to resign from the party and seek a fresh mandate from the people of Makueni. And we want to assure him that he will lose the seat even before the first ballot is cast. No longer the scribe he has been this Wambua guy. He has evolved into a real Kenyan politician. As for Kibwana, Kwa sababu tukitisha, tukambiwa kwamba ukitisha, unaharibia mtu mgine. Yeye, mimi ikiwa naitisha, na ya naitisha na niaribia. Well, it's taken him a while, but finally, he now understands what hard tackling politics entails. 
Bado mimi niko kwa debe 2022. Hold your horses mutua. Kibwana just said any among you three can be president, you know. Na ye mutua ende Masai land. Hapa hapa Masai. Haite mkutano ije watu miatano. Tambia kanozo tuachie mutua. Lakini hata umbwa wao nyumbani wanao walisha. Wakisikia wana mkutano wa kuitisha kiti ya rais. Hakuna umbwa hata moja anakaisa kaa nyuma yao. But Wambua, how did Mama Ngilu win in a wiper stronghold? Ngilu converted herself into a campaign manager for Steve Nkalonzo Musioka in Kitui. Our watu wa wiper, niliwashinda daytime. Kawashinda kabisa. Walikuja, wote. Nilisema chunge ni uyu Ngilu. Something is cooking in Ukambani. And believe you me, it's not Mudha Okoi. Kwe dhena mwondo ateti yao president. Hata mimi watu wanataka ni itishe. Kibuda kama unge panda kwenye mabega ya kanonzo siyasa ya makuwene, unge tokea kama ngaba na makuwene. In Western Kenya, as deputy party leader of Fort Kenya, nimeanza kufanya kazi na mweshmo ruto na sababu yenyeo. We have not sent anybody to anybody for whatever reason because we know that we have a candidate and the candidate is here speaking to you Kaluale you are walking alone Kama wewe mjinga ulikuwa unafikiri Kaluale ameenda kwa kufanya kazi na rafiki yake Ruto kwa ajili ya kutafuta kazi sorry It was Ford gave birth to Ford Kenya the new Ford Kenya. What piece of Ford will Kaluale take home with him this time around? It is not that I'm a mad man. Sonkore. That must be the Nairobi governor Joho is calling. Sonkore has been on a rather extended working holiday at the coast, and it seems he carried with him the entire office. Time to reshuffle the cabinet came. Charles Kerich returns his position. How about the deputy governor? From the NASA coalition, the headline is uh, Raila Odinga presidential uh, secretariat, blah, blah, blah. It was a letter from NASA pleading with Sonko, so he alleged to nominate one of their own. Mama ODM hatuja hulizwa, hatuna haja, hatutaki kuhusishwa na ile shida inaendelea hapa Nairobi kwa sababu ya ile makosa mlifanya wakati ya kuchagua Sonko. But who signed that letter Sonko? Signed by Norman Magaya, Chief Executive Officer Mambo ya Badilika. Must everything always be about political survival? Sisi tuko kwa siasa kila siku practicing. Na kwa hivyo lazima tuwe tukiongea kitu ya siasa. Okay, let's hear that which you think really matters and it's not politics. Pena, what? Back to Kambani. Uh, professor Kibwana, an otherwise widely respected uh, professor of law, has unfortunately reduced himself uh, to a crybaby. As they say in political language, Kimeumana and Dr. Ruto has the right prescription for such an ailment. You can actually say the Lord's Prayer as many times, especially Mambo Kikiumana, Unasema Marasaba. Emmanuel Juma, Bullseye, NTV. That's it for Bullseye. Of course, we'll have a rerun of it and on our YouTube page if you've missed a good part of it. But I believe it's King Gimu, not King Gimu, as I said earlier. That's right. I probably would have said it even worse. All right. Next up is the sports news with Brian Otwal.